Many of you glad to be in church? Hallelujah. I heard somebody say one time, I'd rather be in church than in the best hospital in the the country. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I, I had a wonderful message for you today and um, could not could not get away from something I felt like the Lord wanted me to share. And um, uh, you know, that's, sometimes that is a little bit uncomfortable. But when you know it's the Lord, you just have to go with it. And I believe that the Lord's going to bless you. How many of you have heard about what's going on in different parts of the country right now with the Holy Spirit and moving and touching people's lives? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, a lot of you. Um, some of you just not paying attention, but it's all right. Paying attention to me, I mean. But it's not just happening in the States. It's all over the world. I mean, it's amazing in a moment of time what what the Lord can do. And um, I just, I've, I've been stirred about this for a while now. And, and um, I, I was praying. I told Becky, you know, I pray, was praying last night. And after I got through, I came in and said, well, I have no idea what I'm going to preach in the morning. I got two or three different things rolling around and, and didn't have a clue till I got up this morning. And, uh, really kind of what direction I felt like the Lord wanted me to, to share with you. And I think you can mark this down as a message that you need to hear. And uh, not only you, but hopefully those that are watching online and you can encourage people to go online and, and watch it uh, as well. It's not anything deep, no big revelation, but I want to talk to you about the former and the latter rain. Now, to be honest with you, if you mention that in most denominational churches, they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. They would not understand that. I think by and large, most of you here have some idea what that means and, uh, and, and are, are um, sensitive to that. But what I want to talk to you about is what does that look like? What, what does that look like? Because believers are looking for something. They're expecting. If you, are, if you have a heart for God, you're expecting something. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You, you, you. I've talked to pastors all over the country uh, regularly. You, know, you, you can ask Becky, you know, I'll say I'm, gonna, I'm having a, a, um, a video conference and I'll be on the phone talking to pastors and a video and, and talking. Everybody's saying the same thing. They're expecting something. And you say, well, we already have it. Well, we do in a measure, but what, what does this look like? So let me give you a few scriptures just to kind of help you with this. In Hosea chapter 6, Hosea chapter 6, I, I, I believe this, this will help you if you just grab hold of this. Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 says this. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Now, now hang on a minute. Let, let me just stop right there a minute. Just for those of you that might not understand what Hosea is prophesying here, he's talking about the end. And a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And so he's actually talking about that the end of a, of a 2,000 year period, which we are at, by, you can look at it from every kind of calendar you want to, we're there. We're there. We don't know the day, we don't know the time, but we do know something is going to happen. We do know Jesus is coming back. But I got to tell you something, I believe with all my heart, before he comes back, he wants a harvest. He wants a big harvest. And so it says here, after two days, he will revive us. So that means we need reviving, stirring up, amen? On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So the beginning of that third day 
we're going to be out of here. So notice the next verse. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. In other words, this isn't a secret. He will come to us. Everybody say, the Lord will come to us. He will come to us, it says, like the rain, like the latter and the former rain on the earth. So that analogy is there is going to be a latter, a former rain and a latter rain. Now, that, that is only connected to harvest. It's seed time and harvest. Because you have that early rain when you plant seed to get the seed growing, and then you have that latter rain to produce the fruit. Well, the Lord said he's going to come with the latter rain but he's, and the former rain. And oh, by the way, they're going to come together. So there'll be a seed time and harvest at the same time. Amos talks about it. There'll be a seed time and harvest. So there's a, there, it says that the Lord's coming to us. It didn't say he's coming for us. He said he's coming to us in a fresh way. Anybody excited about that? Yeah. Yes, hallelujah. And it's coming to revive us, and it's the latter rain and the former rain together. Joel said this over in Joel 2, verse 23. He said, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down to you, the former and the latter rain, in the first month. In other words, they're coming together. So there's another reference to that. So you see that that latter rain comes as well. So over in James in the New Testament, James chapter 5, verse 7, listen to what it says. Be patient, brethren, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives, listen to me, the early and the latter rain. How is God coming to us? In the early and the latter rain. And now I'm not talking about rains like Noah had. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you this from the Word of God. But notice what it says. It says you have to be patient until the coming of the Lord, waiting for the precious fruit. There's fruit. God wants fruit. He, won't, he doesn't want another denomination. You know, there was a movement back, I think it was in the 50s, and it was called the latter rain. They, they were convinced they were in the latter rain. Well, they weren't. They were just in the beginning. That, it's faded away. I don't even know whether there's anybody still connected with that or not. But it was, it was a big, I mean, they called it the latter rain movement. Well, the latter rain movement is the end. Amen, because that's the harvest time. That's what the Lord's looking for is a harvest. So it says that he's waiting for the precious fruit. How does that fruit come? With the early and the latter rain together. So here's what you've got to understand. And you've got to understand how this works. First, you have to look at the early church. Why? Well, because Peter called it, in the, he, he, he quoted the same scripture out of Joel in, chapter, in verse 23. He quoted that scripture and he said, the Lord has given you the former rain faithfully and will cause the rain to come down to you, the former and the latter rain. So apparently the beginning of that rain came on the day of Pentecost. That's when this whole thing started with the rain. Amen. That's when it started. That was a former rain. That's when it, that's when it started. Man, it was a pretty good rain of the Spirit. So, what you have to understand is that it comes with a multiplier, and that multiplier is the latter rain. So you can go read Acts, and we're going to do that today. You can go read over in Acts and get a feel for what the 
latter, the, the former rain did and understand, multiply that however many times you want to guess and find out what the latter rain's going to be with the former rain as well. And this hadn't got anything to do with politics, hadn't got anything to do with who was in, who's in office. Listen, the former rain fell in the midst of a, of a dictator who ruled the whole world. <laughs> it didn't bother God. It didn't faze him. He didn't have to have a Republican Congress or a Democratic Congress to get it done. He didn't have to have Christians in office to get it done. Hey, I'm not against it. We need righteous people. Don't misunderstand me. But that doesn't bother God. That doesn't face him one bit. Everything he did he meant, uh, uh, with Jesus, he did in the midst of tyrants and, and, and dishonest, uh, disreputable people. Just did it right in the middle of them. Didn't bother him a bit. Amen. Listen, if God can move in Louisiana, he can move anywhere. Do you know that right now in, uh, in the Bogalusa area, they're having a revival down there? Did you know? How many of you even heard about it? I don't know how many nights they've been going. Tent revival. Old-fashioned tent revival. Things are happening. Now, if you just want to come to church on Sunday morning and pay your dues, you're going to totally miss out on what God wants for your life. Unless you get hungry for more. Well, I've seen this happen before. Well, then you ought to be ready for more. Amen. Amen. So the multiplier is the latter rain. So somebody said, well, wonder what it's going to be like in the last days with the latter rain. Well, rain's rain. Whatever the rain was in the former is going to be in the latter. It's just going to be multiplied. It's not going to be new. Listen, the mysteries of the kingdom are over, folks. They've been revealed. There's not something hidden that God's saving up for that last bunch of people. No, it's just going to be more. It's just going to be multiplied. Everybody still with me? It's rain, it's just more. So if you go back and look at the foundation of the latter rain, which is the former rain, you can find out what things are going to look like. Y'all still with me? You can find out what things are going to be like. So, so let me just, and, I, and I'm, I, I'm not going to get to everything today. I'm not going to try. I'm probably going to pick back up on this uh, uh, Wednesday night and talk some more about it. But the point is that the latter rain is just more rain. More. Everybody say more. more. Hallelujah. So what did it look like? Well, let me just show you. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. You know what happened in Acts, right? They were, they were, the Bible says in Acts 2, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to what? Speak in other tongues. Ooh, revival can't have that. Well, it did in the early church. It did all the way through Acts. Well, that's passed away. Then how can the latter rain and the former rain be the same? Well, the former rain was something else, and this rain is different. Well, it's the same Holy Spirit. How can it be different? No, it's just multiplied. So it says in verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, and all my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Well, that's passed away. Well, the latter rain's passed away then, because it's still rain. Well, what's the key here? He said, I'll pour out my spirit. I'll come to you as the rain. Whoo, hallelujah. Just stick with me. 
So we know that it's going to look like that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out in a greater way than he ever has been. Now, you got to be careful about that because that's dangerous for somebody that's already been filled with the Holy Spirit. You know why it's dangerous? Because you think you know more, you got more, and you don't. I wish I had time for Brian. Where's Brian Grisham? I wish I had time for Brian and Leanne to come up here. I don't have time. Raised up in the Baptist church. Baptist born, Baptist bred. I don't want to say Baptist dead, but, <laughs> but close, he said. But you know what? Something happened to them. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. Whole new world. Whole new world. Great testimony. But you know, you, you can't say, well, you know, they, they ain't got what I got. I got it longer. I, I got it before you did. Hey, you better be careful of that. You'll miss out on what God's going to do. I, I got to get to my point here because I've got it. But I want to just show you a few of these things. Then I've got a, a, a point I wanted to specifically talk to you about. But so we know that that's going to happen, that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out beyond any measure we've ever seen. That's good news. Amen. What about people who've gotten the Holy Spirit? Well, be filled. Amen. That's what Ephesians talks about. Be filled again. Ephesians chapter 5. Everybody needs a refilling. Amen. So it talks about, doesn't mean the Holy Spirit left you. It just means you need it more activated. So um, not only that, one of the other things that's really critical here in this prophecy about the form and the latter rain is this. Listen to what it says in verse 21. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, they have to go through our doctrinal class and they have to go through this and they have to join the church. And the, No! Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They're, well, I better hush. I'm... I'm, I'm I, I could go so many directions here, okay? So that's something that's going to happen. Verse 20, 33 says this, Therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received the promises of the Father, that's talking about Jesus, uh, from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you see and hear. Jesus is involved in this. That's good news, Amen. Let me show you something else that's part of this. Powerful part of this. Peter said to them, repent. Did I get an amen? amen. Repent. You know repentance is, is part of a move of God. Yeah, those sinners, they need to repent. Well, some of you need to repent. We all need to pay attention to where we are in our lives. And if we've got stuff in there, we ain't got any business having in there. We need to fall before the Lord and repent. So repentance is a big part. Big part of the former and the latter reign together. People being sorrowful for their lives and for their misdeeds and, and life of sin and the way they've lived. And I listen to me. You may not feel that unction right now, but I'll tell you, you get in the presence of God and the Holy Spirit starts working on you, you'll find out real quick whether you're clean or not. Where you're where God wants you or not. You'll, you'll find out. It won't take much. And you can't resist it. You know, the only place in the New Testament where it says they resisted the Holy Spirit was that bunch that stoned Stephen. Stephen said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. The word there, resist, means to fall on. In other words, they were fighting him off. They were literally fighting the Holy Spirit off so they could kill Stephen. That spirit's still around. So it says in verse 39, listen to this. For the promises to you and to your children and all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So this isn't a generational thing. This is for everybody. The Holy Spirit's for everybody. Repentance is 
for everybody. But I like what else it says. He said, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission, that word there. I don't know why they put it there because the word means forgiveness. For the forgiveness of sins. Thank God you can get forgiven. Repentance is part of it, yeah. But thank God you can be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says he'll cleanse your conscience. He'll cleanse you. Hallelujah. That's all part of it. Well, we want, we want the repentance part. We don't want anything else. Well, you might be surprised to find out that when you repent and get baptized, you can get filled with the Holy Spirit. Unless you want to fight it off. Okay? So I'm just showing you a few basics, okay? Because I've got to get to something. So, so <clears throat> here's another basic, okay? In, verse, in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common. There was a commonality between believers. You know all this denominational stuff? It's going to fall to the wayside. And the pastors aren't going to like it. I can't tell you how many pastors over the years who knew me and, and, and knew me, but they, they were of a different denomination, didn't agree with what I preached. And I know that was the case because they voiced it that they would see me and they'd turn and go a different direction. But I want to tell you something. The same people in that church would say, oh, Pastor Sam, I watch you on TV. I love your message. I love the way you preach. I, I want to just go say, did you hear that? <laughs> well, we helped, a, we helped a pastor in town one time many years ago. Um, he had some church members that... Um, uh, their son had tried to commit suicide and, and uh, he was a denominational pastor and he, 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 he knew I knew about airplanes and that type of thing. And he, he said, do you have access to an airplane that you could fly this couple up to New York, their son that is not expected to live? And I said, let me, let me make some calls. And I had somebody at the airport waiting on them about three hours later. And they flew to New York, got there, were able to see their son, pray with him and he actually lived so I get a note from this pastor. And here's what the note said. Okay, it's supposed to be a thank you note. <laughs> Although I don't believe your doctrine and what you preach, I want to thank you for helping this couple. That's going to fall by the wayside. I believe, listen, I, I tell you what's going to happen is the body of Christ is going to drive that kind of stuff out. Yes. There's going to be a commonality. Yes. There's going to be a commonality, not in the pulpit maybe, but there'll be a commonality between believers. I believe that. Because it says they went house to house and they were in Solomon's porch, which is a great, great gathering area in Herod's temple that, where they all met together as well. Amen. So it goes on, and, and, and I'm not going to read all these. Acts 3.19 says that they should repent and be converted, that their sins would be blotted out. What? That a time of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. Man, that's what we're seeing. And it's going to get bigger. And, and people will try to squash it, try to stop it. It'll just go up somewhere else. It'll just... It's just like a fire. You, you might put out the flames, but those embers are still there. They'll go somewhere else. Amen. Now, something else that was preached that, that, that's important, and I think this is something that's going to stir up the world. Uh, Peter said this in chapter 4, in verse 10, he said, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, like the, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Talking about the lame man. This is the stone which a builder rejected by which a building builder has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there, now listen, this is important. Verse 12, nor is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You want to hear something? Listen. 
This is not about, well, this is just one way that God's working. No, it's the way. Not just, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about Jesus. There is no other way. There is no other way. And I believe you're going to hear that proclaimed more and more. It's going to make more and more people mad because they think they've got another way figured out. Here's something else they did. Now, I'm not going to read this, but I, I'm going to just tell you this. Over in Acts chapter 4, in verse 31, it came, uh, they came, Peter and uh, John came back and reported to the people, to the, to the believers, and it said they prayed. You can't have a move of God without prayer. In your personal life, and I believe praying together, that's why we're praying Monday night, we need to pray. Let me give you another one. Acts chapter 5, verse 16. Listen to this. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem. That's because that's where it was contained. That's where the gospel was contained at that time, okay? Bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Healing, listen to me, healing is part of the latter day reign. God wants to heal. He's not opposed to it. He's not fighting it. He's not deciding this one can have it and this one can't. More and more we're going to see that. How about, are you hungry for that? Let me just give you this one real quick. Most of you know who, who Saul was. He was breathing out threatenings. He went out and he was gathering all, all the uh, uh, Christians that he could and locking them up and actually killing some of them. He was the one that held the coats of those that stoned Stephen. But something happened to him. He had a supernatural conversion. You know, there was another supernatural conversion. And man, it was an Ethiopian. We don't even know his name. He had a supernatural conversion. He was reading the Bible. Didn't even know what he was reading. All of a sudden, there appeared to him a man standing next to him named Philip. And he said, what you reading? Well, I'm reading this scripture and I don't understand it. And he said, I can help you. Climbed up in there. Told him about Jesus. Found a mud puddle, stopped, said, let's baptize, right? Well, I'll just baptize you right here. <laughs> baptized him right there in the, in the water, however much it was. Baptized him. Then all of a sudden, Philip was gone. He was found somewhere else in Azotus, gone. He was gone. <laughs> Listen, we're already hearing about that. Jesus is appearing to people in countries where they're not, they're in a, a gospel word. And I believe sometimes angels are saying, listen, just like Cornelius, and I'm going to show you this in a minute. Hey, uh, go find this person. They'll tell you what to do. They'll tell you. Supernatural conversions. I, and, and I predict, a couple of years ago, I predicted there'd be many souls ready to be transformed. Even persecutors that would be transformed. Amen? So I want to encapsulate this portion real quick. No, it won't be real quick. I want to encapsulate this portion of Scripture to let you see what the Lord wants to do. Okay? And, and this is just one area that the Lord just it really jumped out in my spirit that, that we need to be very... Uh, cautious about and pay attention to. And it's found in Acts chapter 10. And we already read the first few verses that, that um, an angel appeared to Cornelius and, and because of his giving and because of, of his, he, he feared God and because he worshiped. And, and um, so this angel said, now I want you to go down to Joppa. There's a man named Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. You can find him. Just go out. Everybody knows Simon. Go ask him. And he'll find him and, and go, go bring him back. He's going to tell you what you need to know. So the centurion did that. He sent men to, to, to Joppa, sent men there to, uh, to find Peter. So while Peter doesn't know any of this is going on, so he, he's waiting for him to fix supper. And he says, I'm going to go up and pray uh, up on, on the roof here and pray uh, a while. And so he was up there praying and while he was praying, all of a sudden a vision 
came. He saw open vision. And he saw this sheet coming down with all of these unclean creatures. You know, the Jews were very picky about what they ate. Because the Lord had spelled out things you don't eat. You don't eat them. The, you know, they, they couldn't have lived in Louisiana because they couldn't eat oysters. <laughs> yeah, or crawfish, or I mean, they'd have been in trouble. <laughs> or catfish. So he sees all these unclean animals that the Lord had before said don't eat. So it came down and... Um, he said, uh, the Lord spoke to him, said, kill and eat. Joe, that's our, that's our place right now. <laughs> Gives us the right to go kill and eat. <laughs> Amen. That's a deer hunter joke. So just, so, so Peter said, Lord, I ain't never eaten anything unclean. I mean, that pride, that religious pride rose up. I ain't eaten nothing unclean. And the Lord spoke to him and said, what I call clean. Now I'm paraphrasing here. Don't you dare call unclean. Listen to that statement again. What I call clean. Don't you dare call unclean. Boy, you better be careful about people you don't want to touch. People you don't want to share the gospel with. People that you don't want to receive. Because God said what I call clean. Don't you dare call unclean. I walked through uh, the, uh, a, 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 a city of 40,000 people built on a dump with cardboard houses in the Philippines in Manila. Some of the filthiest people you would ever want to meet. But I want to tell you something. God didn't see them that way. He didn't see them as unclean. He didn't see them as unfit. We walked through there telling people about Jesus and praying for the sick. And this lady brought me a little baby. And that's the nastiest baby I believe I've ever seen. It had diarrhea, had a diaper on, but it was unclean, nasty. And I have to tell you, my flesh wanted to just hold that baby like this and pray for it and move on. But something on the inside of me said what God calls clean, don't you dare call unclean. And I can always wash my clothes. And I held that baby and I prayed over that baby because it had gotten dehydrated and was almost dead, the eyes rolling back in, her, in their head. And I prayed for that baby, handed it back to the mother and went on about my business. A little while later, I heard this mother screaming and hollering. The baby had just come alive. Started crying, hadn't cried in a long period of time. Started, started crying, started taking food. The diarrhea had stopped. Listen to me. You better be careful what you call unclean, what you don't want to mess with. Because that may be the very one that God sends across your path. So the Lord said that to him three times. It took three times. You know, Peter always worked in threes. He denied Jesus three times. Peter had to ask him three times, do you love me? God had to ask him three times. I mean, Jesus had to ask Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? <laughs> so he knew, talking to Peter, it's going to take me three times to get this in his head. <laughs> so he, he, he said it to him three times. Well, Peter didn't have a clue what he was talking about. Until those men knocked on the door. We're looking for Peter. Cornelius sent us. And, he, and the Holy Spirit had already spoken to him. There are going to be some men come knock on your door. Go with them. Well, he was ready to do that till he saw they were Gentiles. Till they were unclean. But because of what the Holy Spirit said, he went with them. So he walks into, he comes to Cornelius' house. They're shocked. He's shocked because they had no relationship, no fellowship. Boy, you better be careful who you don't want to have. To, I better hush. I'm going to. So Peter, go, Peter goes there and, and, um, and 
Cornelius explained to him and, and uh, he said, uh, he said, so here you are. Talk to us. And here's what Peter said. I perceive God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you're a Pentecostal, whether you're a charismatic, whether you're a Baptist, whether you're a Church of Christ. It don't, it don't matter. God's no respecter of persons. He was talking about religion. God's no respecter of persons. He's not a, he, he, he doesn't respect one person over another. In verse 35, I'm going to read this to you out of the message translation. I love what it says. It makes no difference. Listen to this. Wait a minute. Verse 34, I'm going to message. Where, where am I here? I can't find it. Let me read it to you. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If God, if you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is wide open. The door is wide open. See, we, we think everybody's got to come through channels. Now, you know, we have Discover because we want to help people. We want to get them connected and we want to help them. But that, that ain't got anything to do with salvation. It just has to do with helping you. But you have to understand and realize when God starts looking at us, uh, if you want God and you're ready to do as, uh, do as he says, the door's wide open. Because what God calls clean is acceptable. You think about the woman caught in adultery. They drug her out. They said they caught her in the very act. I always still get upset about that. Where was the man that was involved with that? Anyway, they drug her out in the street. We're going to stone her. Jesus did something just the opposite. He forgave her of her sins. You better be careful. You're in this move of God. You better be careful. What God calls Clean, don't you dare call unclean. I had way too many. Hey, uh, one of my best friends later on said the reason he never talked to me about Jesus because he said, you were so bad, Sam, I didn't think you'd ever listen. <laughs> he, was he was right. But God was calling me clean. God had other plans. You never know. We used to have the meanest man in Cedar Grove in our church till he went to heaven. Nobody could believe that Tommy Hitchcock had gotten saved. He was, he was just mean. But buddy, he became a teddy bear when he got saved. Served God, came to this church his whole life. Loved the Lord. You think about that demoniac at Gadara that Jesus ministered to. Came and fell down and worshiped Jesus. Demon possessed, and he came and worshiped Jesus. He came and worshiped Jesus. Oh, we got to get people like that out of the church. No, we don't. We need to get them delivered. Now, listen to what I'm saying. You want to see God do something, you better be ready for what God wants to do. Because it's not going to be religious. It's not going to be religious. Listen, we try to make you comfortable in here. Nice chairs, you know, and air conditioning, heat, whatever it takes, make you comfortable. But to be honest with you, I hope you get uncomfortable before Jesus comes back. And not with your seat or not with the heating and air conditioning, just seeing what God can do in people's lives. That you, you, just, get, you just get uncomfortable. You'd be amazed at what, what the Lord can do if, if you'll just let him. But this demon-possessed person, man, they wanted to run from him. They wanted to hide from him. They didn't want to face that. The guy came down and fell at Jesus' feet and worshiped him full of demons. How can he worship the, with, full of demons? Because his spirit, man, knew there was something else. 
Sometimes people don't always, their face and their expressions are not what's on the inside of them. And the Lord ministered to him, cast those devils out of him, cast a legion of devils out of him. And everybody came to see. Everybody wanted to see. And he was there, and the Bible says he was there sitting with Jesus in his right mind. In his right mind. When we first started this church, we hadn't been going very long, and I, I don't remember. But we may not have been going six months, maybe. I don't remember now. We were still meeting in the hotel room that we were in and had about, I don't know, 30, 40 people maybe. And, and, um, and one day this lady brought this young woman in. No, she came to me. She said, my daughter, would you pray for my daughter? She's in a mental institution. And I think she's demon possessed. I said, yeah, I'll pray for her. Well, I had a little cubicle set up in the back before services to pray and get ready for the service. And it, it, it was a big window looking out the front. And I looked out the front of that building and I saw Klein, Blunt, and a couple of other men bringing this woman in and she was stiff as a board. And they were just bringing her, bringing her in just like she was a cot, but she didn't have a cot. She was just stiff as a board. And they, they brought her in and brought her up, in, up to my office. And her mother said, well, you said you'd, you'd pray for her. So I, got, I checked her out. <laughs> so they brought her in and couldn't sit her down. So they just leaned her up against the chair. So she was like this, leaned up against the chair. And they left. <laughs> so I started talking to her, you know, and I, I, I knew her name and I started talking to her. And all of a sudden, she became limp and she wound around like a snake down on, on, on the floor. What God calls clean don't you dare call unclean. Y'all listening to me? So I started talking to her a minute and I knew pretty quick that was the devil talking out of her. And I just cast the devil out of her. And, and literally she went from being a snake on the ground to sitting up having a normal conversation. But now listen. She wasn't completely delivered. So, but, but we, we loved her. We loved on her. And every once in a while, she'd have a, what we would call, you know, just kind of have an episode. And it was always during church. And it was always during the Word, when you're preaching the Word. And she'd, she'd sit back in the back, and she'd scream. Just scream out. <laughs> And I'd just tell her, but just be thank the Lord we didn't have a lot of guests back in those days. That'd have been running out the door. But, but we just said, she's okay. God's working in her life. Stretch out your hand and pray for her. And we'd pray, we'd pray for her. We did that for weeks. Finally, the screaming stopped. And she was just as normal as, as, as could be. Totally, totally healed. Now, now, she went home to be with the Lord not too, a couple months maybe, Becky, after that? Huh? Longer, you know, six months maybe. Less, maybe even a year. But came to church, loved the Lord, had a smile on her face. And, and she had witnessed to her neighbor and went back to her house and just passed away. Just went home to be with the Lord. I can't explain that. But what I do know is that what you call unclean, God sees a whole different way. Amen. And you've got to be careful how, how, you, uh, how you respond to people and how you, how, you, uh, how you deal with that. I believe that Peter, because we see evidence later that Peter kind of backslid a little bit with that. 
because he wanted to be with the Gentiles, he wanted to be with his crew rather than the Gentiles. But now listen to me. I, I believe without that incident, Peter would not have been able to lead the church because that religious spirit had to fall. So there's a difference between a religious spirit and loving Jesus. And you've got to be ready to understand and discern the difference. And don't get, don't get yourself all hooked up and tied up to something that's just pure religious uh, actions and not, and not what God wants in your life. Okay? You still with me? So, so the Bible says that Peter, when he was talking to them, he said in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he, in, in regard to this, talking to them about God not being a respecter of persons, he said this to them. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing what? All who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Hadn't changed. Hadn't changed. So this bunch, this bunch, they're, they're sitting there. They're listening to all this. He told them God's a judge of the living and the dead. Believe on him and receive forgiveness of sins. They're all just listening. Peter's preaching. They're listening. Something happened. Listen to what it says in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10. Listen to this. While Peter was still speaking, didn't even give an invitation. While Peter was still speaking, those words that we just read, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. The Holy Spirit fell. On all those that heard the word. I have experienced that just a couple of times in my life. One, I was in the Philippines and I was preaching uh, uh, to a group of people and, and all of a sudden, before I could even pray or say or give an invitation or anything, the Holy Spirit fell on the whole congregation, on everybody that was there. How do you know the Holy Spirit fell? Well, listen to the rest of the verse. Listen to what it says. Let me, let me read the whole thing to you. It says, those that were of the circumcision, the religious bunch, who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. How'd they know that the Holy Spirit fell? How'd they know that they were that, that, that something had happened? Because they were speaking in other tongues. Listen, I want to tell you something. This great ladder move of God is going to be filled with people just start just being filled with the Spirit, start speaking in tongues. Just, just be filled with the Spirit. Don't even understand how they got it. Just filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you one more story? There was a, a young man, two young men, I've told this story before, but there, there were two young men many years ago that committed an atrocious murder here in Shreveport. And um, uh, they were sentenced to life. In I, guess, I guess they're both still in prison to this day, this many, many years ago. But somehow one of them got my name and, and he he asked me to please pray for him. He'd asked God to forgive him and he was saved, but he, he wanted to know something about this Holy Spirit. And I'll never forget, we were praying on a Monday night and the Spirit of God came on me and I began to pray for this young man and to cry out to God for this young man. And back then, you know, you couldn't really communicate that much with uh, with with. Uh, inmates, and I got a letter from him. He said, I was laying on my bunk, just worshiping God and, and praying, and 
all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit fell on me. And I began to speak in this language I didn't know. Is that the Holy Spirit? Is that speaking in tongues? In his cell. Come to find out, I wrote him back that it was the exact time that I was praying for him. Listen, you better be ready for that. You better be ready for those that's come up to you and say, hey, you believe in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? And you don't want to say yes because you think you're going to be marked. And the whole time they're looking for answers. They're looking for answers. It's part of what God is doing in, the, in this last day, in this latter rain. And you say, well, I want that, but I don't want that kind of revival. Well, if you want the latter rain, you're going to have to have it. Now, I, I know some people, they want to be doctrinal about it and say, well, that's just doctrinal. No, it has nothing to do with no doctrine. It has to do with the former and the latter rain. Peter said it did. Peter said it did. If you want to argue with Peter, you can find him. I'll tell you where he is. You can go talk to him. But the point is, all of these things that I just shared with you, and there, and there are more, and, and look, you can go down through the whole book of Acts. And, and in a whole, listen to me, eight years later, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Still being filled. Philip was there and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Ten years later from the day of Pentecost is when this happened to Cornelius. Twenty years later in Acts chapter 19, Peter met a bunch. and he, I mean, Paul met a bunch. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And he said, they said, we didn't even know there was any Holy Spirit. Do you know that that's really the way most of the church is today? They'll tell you they have the Holy Spirit, but they don't know the Holy Spirit. And that's this, that we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Paul laid hands on them. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. And guess what happened? They started speaking in other tongues. It, it hadn't stopped, folks. It's not a doctrine. Well, in a sense, it is a doctrine. But it's part of the latter day reign. It's part of what God, healing, repentance, call, just calling on the name of the Lord, not being a respecter of persons, being open to whoever, whatever God wants. That's where you have to live your life. Get rid of the, the, any kind of religious spirit you've got about you, thinking that you're, you've, got, you've got a corner on the market or you're doing enough when you know you aren't. Nobody can. I'm not trying to make you do something. I'm trying to give you a perspective. Because listen, we sang that song. I'm going to sing it again, Becky. You weren't paying attention, were you? <laughs> I, I'm going to sing this song before we close today. Say, so, well, we're running late. Well, you're still going to beat the Baptist to lunch, so you'll be all right. <laughs> How many of you were raised Baptist? I love you. Look at that. You know what I'm talking about. My major influence in my life were my grandparents who served at Summer Grove Baptist Church their whole lives. Their whole lives. But I'm stirred. Now here's what I want to do. Okay? Listen. If you feel like you need to leave at any time, just slip out and leave if you have to. But I, I just want to pray for anybody who wants a touch from the Lord or is hungry for more or just you just need something in your life today. I want to pray for you today. And I want to sing this song again. And if that's you and you want prayer this morning, where did Paul go? Okay. When you see him come back in, I want you to clap. <laughs> we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing this song. If you need prayer, some of you just need to be, you've, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit for years, but it's just not 
dynamic in your life? Well, it can be. Are y'all here? It can be. There he is. That's for you. That's for you. How can you laugh and be serious at the same time? I want Paul to come up here and pray with me, help me pray, since he wasn't here to hear what I had to say. Hopefully Debbie explained it to him. So stand up with me. We're gonna sing this. If you're starting to come up here, we're just gonna pray for you. And listen, let it be by the Holy Spirit, not by your feelings. Amen. Just slip out of your seat and come on up here as we sing. Come on. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. Come on.